care about work-life balance or how you're managing stress. But what about in the workplace, the mental well-being, the mental stress that you're dealing with, the times that perhaps there's situations in the office that are just overwhelming and that you either might get angry, you might, some of us withdraw or tears might come, which are really anger underneath those tears, but have no control if we're emotional. But that's really what I wanted to talk about this evening was as far as how we deal with anger in the workplace. And, and, and in this conversation, to think of it, not just necessarily in terms of whatever role that you have, but what you're seeing in a practice as far as, let's say someone at the front desk, let's play this safe. Someone at the front desk is totally ticked off. They might've had some situation at home and then they came in and then they started, I don't know, getting into it with another coworker. How do we deal with that? And John, I'm going to start with you simply because, you know, having been an office leader, you probably got that sometimes. Yeah, yes. um, it's it's happened. I was, was it John or Jean? You should still well, call me. John. Because... We're going to call you Fluky. All right, that's fair. <laughs> Fluky tonight. But unless you want to change your role, Fluky, to be the office leader, knock yourself nope. out. Okay, let's go, let's go with you, John. How do you guys... Okay. Deal with the anger, you know, the, the how people are feeling, because it's a feeling, not just, you know, cognitively, oh, this is how we should handle it. Yeah. So I think one of the situations that we have been dealing with as office managers, you know, when I being on that uh, role is we select office managers based on their dental knowledge, right? Oh, they've been in the industry for for, for a long time. But they don't really provide us a training on who, how to identify mental problems, how to identify those solutions. And I think that is the areas that I have I have to learn because I didn't know how to identify that my team members were having stress. I didn't realize that my team members were dealing with stressful situations that were they were bringing it into the office. All I saw was we have a production, we have a goal and how we get the, the office, um, like the process to run smooth, right? That was my thought process. And that's something they don't teach us normally. Uh, I think, but transparency and, and now that I've been in this role for a long time, I'd be able to identify those and always talk to the person, you know, bring the person to the side and let the person into a room to vent. Because sometimes all we need is to let that anger out. And, and us as a leader, sometimes we have to be a sound, a sound ear for our, um, for our team to be able to let those out and be able to go back to the work um, with the workplace with a better attitude, with a better understanding. And, but I think it, it's, it's a problem that we have in the industry that I have take multiple courses and nobody really teaches how to identify um, uh, those situation and be able to address it before it happens, right? Instead of being reactive to be proactive. So what, what about, Malia, have you seen, like, do the consultants come in and teach office leaders or, or anybody how to manage conflict? Yeah, I think that's a great point that you made that it's, it's not like a readily taught skill, like in hygiene school. And I taught hygiene school for a long time. We didn't really teach about, you know, HR principles, pretty much about like managing and and the business side of it so much. I mean, we definitely deal with a lot of patients in school, so you kind of have to pick up on the little things, but yeah, experience is the biggest uh, hat to that. It's just d working with patients, working with coworkers, but unfortunately with experience that takes time and you have to have great experiences and not great experiences to learn from that, unfortunately. So I've definitely seen consultants come in. I mean, I personally love to read like a leadership books and things like that, just to kind of get a, like a leg up on what's happening and how to talk to people. I feel like patients, when I, when I'm looking at this from like a patient perspective, patients in the last couple of years have been more stressed than ever. I don't know if you guys have felt that same way, 
but patients, it's stressful right now. Life is just kind of stressful and people are not afraid to express that stress anymore. And it's hard as a clinician that's working with a patient for an hour, hour and a half, whatever, to feel that anxiety and stress from them and then not take it in myself. So just really uh, kind of doing your own research is really helpful to see what works and what's not, what's going to work with your patient population, maybe what's not. And I really like the point of just kind of heading it on first when it comes to a staff instead of waiting for it to boil over. I think it's really great when we can kind of like nip things in the bud really early on instead of waiting, waiting, waiting till they boil out. I remember when I was a brand new hygienist and I worked with an assistant and um, she would do things I didn't love, but I was brand new. I didn't know how to like express that. And so just one day I just kind of snapped. I was kind of not very happy. You know, it was a stressful day. And looking back, I'm like, I should have just like talked to her before that happened. And it would have made the situation so much better. We're actually still friends and I still talk to her regularly, which was great, but it would have been such a smoother process for both of us if I would have just been honest with her from the beginning. So um, unfortunately experience is the best teacher, which is no fun for us sometimes, but. I I read a book called, uh, called Well Done. It's a very easy to read, very small book, but it's really talk about how to, um, as a leader, how to sometimes communicating in a positive way, because sometimes as a leader, we start communicating as of in a negative way, right? identifying what people do wrong. But then because we don't want to hear that, then you don't talk to your coworkers about the things you don't like, because you don't like you feel like, well, I don't like when the doctor tells me this. So I don't want to say do the same thing you know, talk the same way. So we hold it, like you said, we hold it, hold it onto explodes. But if in the leadership, we you, we take the concept of a positive reinforcement, the team will feel better to communicate amongst each other because it is a positive environment. And I, I feel like when it is a negative environment, we tend to hold those uh, uh, negative emotions to don't create more stress. And I love the idea of like checking in with your team, like regularly. And instead of just being like, they have to come to me as the leader when they're upset, you know, just that keeping that, um, culture of like communication and touching it, the touching base, things like that really just, again, kind of simmers things before they get to exploding overwhelm or someone feels like they have to quit or X, Y, and Z. That is so helpful. I've loved working with like managers or, consultants or doctors or whoever that will regularly check in with us as the staff and just make sure we're cool and kind of understand us as a person. It makes us feel more able to communicate with them back. So just kind of getting things early on is so helpful. And Fluky, let me ask you this. You're the dentist. You're the, you're the business owner. <laughs> I'm not coming to you. If I got a problem and I work at your front desk, I'm not even coming to the office leader. You know, there's, I mean, let's be honest. This is dental, just like any other work environment. How much of the venting to each other of the, okay, backstabbing, gossip, let's just call it as it is. This happens, not in Fluky's office, but it does happen in, in many practices across the country. And Usually, I would guess by the time it gets to you, Dr. Fluky, it probably has escalated even more so, or what are your thoughts? Well, a, a couple of things. We always fostered a, a feeling of empowerment in the staff. Um, I would always say that we're all in this together um, because it's true. We all are, and we all have important jobs and everybody needs to feel you know like they've got job satisfaction and that they're enjoying their jobs and I always said I'm not above whatever the job is I mean, I'll take the trash out you know I'll clean the bathroom if I have to if somebody else can't do it and they need help um, I always said that was important and we're all in this together I mean I I would be a lousy uh, administrator I wouldn't want to deal with insurance and trying to coordinate the schedule and hit production goals. Um, 
I'm not a very good dental assistant and I've had to have been a dental assistant a couple of times in my career when we've had somebody out for the day or whatever and, and things get crazy and somebody needs help. And I've actually sat and, you know, suctioned and done all the things that an assistant does and I'm lousy at it. I would be a lousy hygienist, but everybody on the team has that role. And if they don't feel empowered to be able to speak up if they don't feel you know that that they're appreciated for what they do that does foster resentment one of the things that we used to do on a regular basis was we would have a staff meeting and we would do the disc personality evaluation everybody fills out the forms and then we would go over um you know this is where this person is on the scale and i always found that helpful because it helps you see the world through other people's eyes and it helps you kind of understand how they communicate better too i mean and it's like that with patients you know if you have a patient for instance who is maybe a mechanical engineer they want to know what you're doing and they want to know why you're doing it and you know what step you're on and, and some people i've had other people that have said no i'm just going to close my eyes and you just tell me whenever it is is done i'm not going to talk I'm going to put on sunglasses. I'm going to lay with my eyes closed and you guys just do what you do. And you let me know when you're done because I'm anxious. And I don't really want to know what's going on. Um, so it's important to know how people communicate too. Um, but my point being, I'm not coming to you. I might come to Melia as a dental hygienist if we're friends, but it's not, there's a power um, piece here that if I go to my boss on one hand, I'm letting them know that I can't handle this interaction with another coworker. So that might make me look bad. And, you know, it could be the, he said, she said, or she said, she said, or he said, he said, or it said, it said, I can't even keep up with it anymore. But just from the standpoint of if I can't resolve an issue and it's so hard to go to your boss, you know, I would, I, it never got really bad in my office, but a couple of times I had to say, you two, here's a credit card, go to lunch. I'm buying lunch. You two talk it out, figure it out. You're not getting out of this. You're going to lunch or you're going, you know, in the conference room or wherever, and you're going to talk. I'm not going to be there to mediate. You guys go figure it out yourselves. Um, that always worked. Now, it might not work every time, but I think the easiest thing to do in a hierarchical structure, um, I mean, we even do it in a marriage. You go and you tell them that I said, you know, and no, you tell them how you feel. Um, because that's the only way things get better is if you communicate. And usually when communicate occasion breaks down my my grandfather used to say when people stop talking that's how wars start and i think that's so true you know if we just communicate with each other and i don't like it when you do this okay fair i didn't know that um i won't do that anymore or maybe we can do this differently i mean you just got to see other everybody's perspective I know, but a lot of the folks, like the dental assistants or front office staff who are not earning that much, may or may not have the same level of confidence as the dental hygienist or the physician in the practice. And I just want to keep as as we have newer dentists going out into uh, the world now to keep that in mind. Not everyone is as confident as the people who are on this call. So let me shift this a little bit to asking Malia, um, what if it's an ethical issue? So you're seeing something that, and I'm sure we've all seen something either in the workplace or in some walk of our life that you had that cringeworthy moment of, okay, this doesn't feel right. I'm not quite sure that they should be doing this. I'm being asked to do something that I shouldn't be doing. You know, what happens when, again, looking to someone who does not have the comfort to come forward, but is wrestling with an ethical issue. They're not sure what to do. What would, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is like, a, this is like a couple day discussion. This is a tricky one. Cause I definitely were as working as a hygienist, working with other licenses. I've been asked many times to do things that like my state I'm not legally allowed to do, or 
I worked at offices that they're doing things that you're legally not supposed to. And it's very, it's awkward. And it's very like this weird place to be in, to be put in this middle of like, what should I do? Do I lose my job or do I speak up or do I just go with it and like brush it under the rug and then can't sleep at night? It's a weird balance to be in. And I've talked to a lot of hygienists that have been in this situation. Unfortunately, it's so hard um, that we do that. I personally feel like it, it leads to burnout a little bit when we're constantly putting these little ethical dilemmas, but can you give an example um, of like an ethical dilemma that comes? Yeah. I mean, yeah. In my state, we're not allowed to give local anesthesia as a hygienist, unless the dentist is there on site. And so we ask, I get asked regularly, like, Hey, if the, if the doctor's not there running late, the patient came early, can I numb the patient? Honestly, probably nothing would go wrong, right? I've given hundreds and thousands of ejections. I feel confident in my ability, but it's, again, it's, it's just the law of the state right now. So it's, it's a weird position for me to be in. Do I speak up and try to be like, Hey, I can't do this. Or do I just do it? And it's not a big deal and don't ruffle any feathers. Um, that happens all the time. We're seeing a patient technically like a new patient has to be seen by the doctor first. Maybe the doctor's out of town and that we have a new patient with a toothache. They can come see me instead. That's a weird gray area that I'm not supposed to, but really it would be fine if I did. Um, but that happens all the time, unfortunately. And I've worked in offices that asked me to do that regularly. And, um, as, again, as a new grad, a new hygienist in the mark in the field, it's an awkward spot to be in. It's not a fun spot. The couple offices that I did, I eventually left because I didn't personally feel comfortable and I didn't feel confident enough to say anything because it was just, it was, a, it's a weird position to be. Now I feel comfortable to just say something or be like, Hey, this is, this is what I'm legally responsible for. I have a legal, um, uh, responsibility as well with my license. And I'm okay opening that conversation. Uh, but it's, it's a weird spot. I think it's really helpful to talk as a team and be all on the same page. What is legal in your state? What is not? Because I feel like sometimes too, like if your state has on the job training for assistance, like we have here, Sometimes we teach assistants to do things and they don't, they don't even know. They're like, oh, I was taught this in my other office. I didn't even know this wasn't allowed here or I need a special training or X, Y, and Z. So sometimes meeting as a team and figuring out what everyone feels comfortable with, what are the actual laws that we want to follow, things like that, um, make it really nice. So then there's not some weird gray areas uh, that we feel awkward about in the future. So Again, communication, just like every great relationship, communication is key to keep things smooth and running. And um, just a happy team is so much better than working with a team that feels this underneath wrestle every day. And I think uh, the more experience we have, build the confidence to at least ask the question and know. I remember when I was in my 20s and I was a social worker that on the policy and procedure manual when I joined this hospital, it said, and I quote you, that I would work as a nurse as necessary. I worked on a ventilator unit. I'm a social worker. Hmm. And I said, absolutely not. And at least I had my wherewithal I'll say, I can't, if we can't cross that out and initial it, I can't sign something like that, which oh, that's, that's crazy. What about for you, John? Experiences or your thoughts on the ethical issue? I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do believe, I think my, my uh, military background have helped me to be able to stand up for myself and say, I don't think that is right. I'll, I would love to help you, but I don't feel comfortable. I don't think that if it's illegal, you know, I don't think this is illegal in the state of Florida to do that. I have done that multiple times. I have even in my current position, I do a lot of trainings, right? I want to make sure that every every office who's using our product that they know how to do everything. And sometimes doctor will be like, hey, John, could you show this person how to do IPR? And I have to look the doctor in the eye and say, in the state of Florida, you know, in the state of Florida, doing IPR, it's only allowed for the doctor. Unfortunately, I would not be able to help you. And I will encourage you not to teach your team how to do IPR. And 
I think that by position myself there is actually always being respected other than um, the other way around. However, I do see as um, Malia was mentioning the job on in the job training, because, you know, I started as a dental assistant and I was not on the job training. I was trained by the military, but coming into these offices with on the job training assistant, they don't know what they're supposed to do. They just, they do whatever they were taught to do. And I do have seen, I have seen offices and I have to kind of call the doctor to the side because you know, I don't want to create any type of animosity, but call the doctor to the side and say, hey, I just want to let you know that, you know, your assistant is not supposed to be doing A, B, and C. You do, this is your office. You do what is my responsibility to let you know. Um, most of the time, they have they act or at least they act like they have no idea. But yeah, I, I but I, 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 I don't. And think some that. of them don't. <laughs> but I will say, but correct. Some of them don't. Some of them are not a the owner of the practice. They just an associate. You know, the somebody else owner. They just practice in dentistry there. And they're like, well, I didn't know since I got out of school, this person has been doing that, you know? So, um, but I think like, like, like we, I think communication is the key here. And as long as we do it, we respect, I, I, I think that we are in a field that people listen to each other as long as the communication comes from respect. And I think sometimes when we're in, the, in a stressful environment, that way of communication is very hard. So true. What about you, Fluky? Ethical issues that have come landed on your doorstep? Well, I, I think it's important for the doctor to be knowledgeable about the laws in their state. Um, you know, taking courses. I mean, I actually, about every, probably every year or two, I actually sit down and I read the Dental Practice Act and you know, look at it. I mean, they're all available online now to know those kind of things, because I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to break the law. And the, the one thing about being a doctor is that no matter what happens, the doctor's responsible for it. And I think there's probably a lot of times that people just don't realize, or they think, Oh, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Um, but the laws are there for a reason. And, you know, the reason that you have a license, whether it's to practice hygiene or, or to practice dentistry, is there's a certain amount of trust that goes with that. Trust from the, from the governing body, the state, and trust from your patients. And the people need to know you're trustworthy. Um and so I think it's a good idea to review things. I mean, I don't ever want to do anything or have somebody do something that that's illegal. Um, that's just part of my DNA. So I think being knowledgeable and communicating that to your staff is important too, because as Jean and Malia said, I mean, sometimes you hire someone who's worked in another, another office and they've been told, oh, it's okay to do this or, or, you know, whoever trained them didn't know it wasn't okay and they're they're doing it because they think it's okay i think as human beings most of us don't want to do something that's not okay so it's just important to be knowledgeable and then to communicate that knowledge i mean doctor you know the original root of the word doctor comes from teacher and i think that's important yeah i like that you said that it really is important to be trustworthy for our patients too right mm -hmm. i feel like Stuff happens all the time, these weird gray areas in your state, and you might, you would never get in trouble. You know what I mean? No one would ever say mm -hmm. anything, and we can easily cut these little corners. But as a patient, I would want to know that the people that are working with me and on me are trustworthy. And I think that's really important. I, it's it's so fascinating, too, when, like, something comes out in the news about dentistry, you know, like someone had a security breach or like an infection control breach and it hits the news and everyone's talking about it and it really shakes up people's trust. So I would hate for us 
to be in the news regularly for these breaks of trust. So patients aren't coming to us as much or not seeking out the care because that trust link is broken. It's such an important part of our patient um, health care contract that we make. And I think that some of the times it is also who you trust or who you're going to talk to. Uh, I mean, the downside is, as in any workplace, there's a tendency to be, oh, Melody, I can't believe you just, what just happened here? And then that rumor mill takes off and it just eats away at a corporate culture or a practice's healthy work environment. And so, again, it is, I'm going to always just for the folks who are not as pushy, shovey, and obnoxious as I am, speak on their behalf and saying, you know, there has to be a safe space. Now that safe space could be, you know, even those old fashioned anonymous uh, mailboxes that you just put suggestions in. So that way, I'm not sending it from my email. You don't know necessarily where it came from, or it might be uh, Reddit, I know, or your Facebook group or your national association, you know, someone that you can talk with uh, preferably without identifying your practice and maintaining, you know, the confidentiality of your workplace, but also, you know, some support system, whether you have a mentor in this industry, whatever your discipline is. Um, I really like, John, what you said about, and I'm sure Fluky didn't get any of that training in dental school for conflict resolution. I mean, they were teaching them dentistry, not necessarily managing a business. But just what are what are things that can be done to both help improve that communication and again make a safe space because we just have to keep being aware of the power difference that there can be repercussions and so you know whoever you could trust and a lot of times to be honest I tell people talk to somebody outside of the practice I know you guys are going to be like oh what is she doing because sometimes when people are right in the thick of it they may not be thinking it out straight. And it may be, okay, I'm gonna tell Melia what's going on. And then it's getting repeated and I didn't even get a chance to figure out, okay, I should go to Jean first and you know let, let him know that there's this problem. Well, he may already have found out about it from the rumor mill. And however, I wanted to present it to him, he may have heard a whole nother avenue. And so it's always better to be proactive versus reactive after someone has vented about you, at least in my experience. Was that, is that fair, Jean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but what I think the biggest problem we have beyond that in dentistry is the unclear um, on who is the person who relayed the message, as you mentioned, like, you know, like, where should I go to? because you have an office manager that some offices really have that role of an office manager. Some offices, an office manager, just a front desk person uh, with a title. Uh, <laughs> and so then you have the doctor if there are the owner. So then you are like, so some information goes to the office manager as needed. Some other information jump the office manager and it goes to the doctor. So because, you know, especially, you know, I have to say, especially assistants, because they work with the doctor on a one-on-one. -on -one. So it's a lot easier sometimes to have that communication. But what happened is then the chain of command get broken. People are going to so many directions on giving feedback. And that is where the problem a lot of time comes. Like once you have too many venues on communication, you have too many conflicts, you have too, too many problems. If dentistry is very hard because the owner is the boss, which by the th at the same time, he is in the front line with everybody else. And in my case, um, I remember when I was managing the office, I, I told the doctor, if, 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 if a team goes to you <laughs> with a problem, don't come to me, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> because they had to come to me because that way he can focus on the dentistry. I can work, focus on the administration. There are things that I feel that had to be brought up to my chain of command, which would be bring him on board. But that way we have a one stream line of communication and we can minimize a lot of these problems 
that I see so often in offices because direct information, and I, you know, I don't know to say problems I like to call feedbacks. Feedbacks are coming from too many directions. And sometimes it just it just became a big, a bigger problem that should be because there's not a strict uh, shit of command. But I think that that's pretty much what you were mentioning about um not knowing where the communication will go, but that happens very often in the dental office. So true. I, I know that we're coming to a close, but I want to give each of you a chance. Anything else, you know, a, a, a short response as to what message you would want to give to the people who are watching this, who are in the dental field um, on today's topic. I'll start with you, Fluki. Your closing comment. I would, I would say to remember that we're all in this together. Everybody help everybody. It's the old analogy of rowing the boat you know if everybody's got their oar at a different angle or you know paddling at a different speed all you do is go in circles and you just repeat the same cycle and i'm not sure who said it i they sometimes attributed to albert einstein but i don't know if he said it the old analogy of um when um, when you do the same thing over and over and expect different results, that's the definition of insanity. And it really is true. So if you feel like there's insanity, then break the chain, you know, break that spiral and make some changes. But listen to everybody. Everybody listen to everybody else and treat their opinions with respect. Um, two rules of life, I think, are be nice, show respect. And if you can do those two things, everything else works out. So true. What about you, Melia? Yeah, I was going to go along the same lines. That Just remember that everyone we work with, our patients, they're all humans. They have so much back things going on that we have no idea what's happening. And sometimes those are coming to the surface when we're, when we're interacting with them. So just really meeting people where they're at, remembering that they're humans and hopefully connecting with them on a human level will make such a difference with your interactions. And how about for you, John? Well, I would say probably foster communication amongst the team. I think open dialogue, learn to identify that team members need help. But most important, if you are working in a work environment that is hostile, just there are many offices out there that will be more than happy to have you in their team. Like John's um, team, I'm pretty sure they're happy to be with him. There are many doctors like him. So just reach out to an office and make sure you find a, a true home. Well said. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming out, out. <laughs> tonight <laughs> doesn't feel virtual and, and just thank you again for your comments and as always gives us a chance to think and think about it from different disciplines perspectives so really appreciate all of you so we'll see you guys next time